Hello. Hello and welcome to the PCM Tech Help Show. I am your host, Craig Chamberlain, and we are officially broadcasting live here at PCM Tech Help Show headquarters in northern Indiana. I can't tell you exactly where that's at because, to be honest with you, I'm not even sure yet. Now, the PCM Tech Help Show live segment is called PCM Tech Talk Live, and that's where you are with me right now. And the Tech Talk Live environment is a casual environment for my subscribers to ask me questions, and hopefully I can answer them. If I can't answer them, hopefully I can direct them to a location or locations who can actually help them out. So I've been in tech for about 15 years. Um, People have asked me my age. I'm not that reluctant to get it out. I'm under 30. But um, I'm more than happy to teach you guys stuff. I absolutely love tech. It's been a big, huge thing for me for a long time. And so this is the moment or the hour I set aside on a Monday through Friday segment so that I can actually talk about tech with you guys and maybe, if I'm lucky, teach you a little something and not waste your time. So... Tune in every Monday through Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern, and uh, check it out. Now, if you're listening to me on Apple, welcome to the segment. Um, I am officially syndicated on YouTube. I'm, I'm sorry, on Apple iTunes. Uh, the show I finally got broadcasted uh, and set up to, I can upload my video, and people can at least listen to the audio, because the video quality on, on Google Plus isn't the best yet, but you know we're waiting for that to get better. But in the meantime, you can at least listen to the audio versions of these right through Apple iTunes and just go to the iTunes store and look up PCM Tech Help or Tech Help even. PCM on its own should find me. Uh, you'll see a really, the traditional picture of me that I use and you'll be able to subscribe to the service and you'll receive the episode probably the day after because that's usually when I actually go on to iTunes to do that. No, I did have somebody ask me how I got syndicated on iTunes, and it's not a very difficult thing to do. Um, I started by actually setting up my broadcast through blip.tv, and that's a free registration. And blip.tv, if you upload your videos to their service, has an option to distribute your service to Apple iTunes, and they create an iTunes feed for you. And then you can submit that feed to the Apple iTunes store, and if they approve you through the Apple iTunes store, then they'll start syndicating that feed. So anytime you want a new video uploaded to YouTube, um, you just upload your video to, I mean, to iTunes. i gotta, I got to stop doing that. you got to upload your video to uh, blip.tv, and then they'll syndicate it for you. It's a very cool service for being a free service. Of course, they won't syndicate it in HD unless you're actually paying for like nine dollars a month it's not that unreasonable to be honest with you so again you can reach me at pcmtechhelp.com uh, that's where I keep all my stuff uh, and of course YouTube that's where all my subscribers live and uh, let's go ahead and get started today uh, just to start things off I'm going to talk about making money online and I like to do a little short segment before we get into the questions because when the questions when you, I first start this stream, it usually takes a little while for people to kind of jump in and, and get involved. And a lot of people don't know what questions to ask. Like I said, any questions go. Uh, you can ask anything. I can't guarantee you that I'll know the answer, but I'll try my best to actually get you in the right direction. But making money online is kind of a huge question I get all the time. And yes, there are ways to make money on, online. And of course, there's no real good Ill, uh, good illegitimate ways that I know of that can actually succeed in giving you income in the long run. Um, I make money online doing this kind of thing. Uh, I've been doing YouTube in particular for about three years. I've been doing web stuff for about 10. So I didn't probably start monetizing my website until about three years ago. I dabbled in monetization and all kinds of different ways to make money, whether it be through referrals, uh, getting people to sign up for services and they give you money. Um, I've tried the, what's it called, the exact, I don't think it's referral, but it's when you're a partner and then you refer them to a product and you get a percent of commission on it. I don't know the exact word off the top of my head. I should know it. It's very common. Um, like through Amazon, there's, uh, there's services for that. So you can actually make money off of linking to a product and reviewing it on your website. And if somebody goes and buys that product within the next week or two, you'll get credit for it and you'll make money. 
Um, and then there's, of course, uh, just ad-based monetization, where if people click on your ads or see a certain amount of impressions of your ads, you get paid what's called a CPM, or cost per million, or cost per thousand impressions, cost per impressions, basically. So there's a number of different ways to make money online, and really what avenue you decide to pursue is heavily dependent on the actual service or product you want to offer. A lot of people don't understand that blogging itself is not a service that is heavily targeted for selling products. Blogging is a, more of an inform information service, and that's why a lot of bloggers make most of their money through ad-based revenue streams. Um, ads are based on impressions. Impressions are based on blog posts. Blog posts often are associated with quantity and a following. You know, you can get a, a group of people who are willing to follow things you write about, and sometimes you can influence them to buy, buy products, sometimes you can't. But really, you're banking heavily with blog posting on getting people to show up continually over time and getting new traffic to continue to follow you over time. And so you want your numbers to go up because AdSense is a number game. Uh, ads per thousand impressions and click-throughs are is really a big numbers game. You have to have the numbers there to make a reasonable amount of money. No matter which service you decide to go with, that's going to be true. And those numbers need to be consistent. Now, you can go viral and that money can make a huge that video can make a huge surge of money for a short-term gain and of course that can happen it's like winning the lottery basically but the real long-term money is going to be in consistent traffic over a long period of time and as you know there's a number of factors that have to come into play with that you have to generate regular quality content you got to generate uh, and it's got to be quality it's got to be your own you have to be able to keep people interested you have to be able to do it regularly and be consistent about the topics you talk about. You can't bounce around a lot. Um, but if you're interested in making money online, I'm going to I'm going to touch on it just a little bit here because it does look like we're starting to get some questions. Um, you really need to sit down and think about what you want to do. Do you want to build a website that offers a service? And that service, do you want to charge for that service? If you're going to be building websites for a living, and you want to build a website that sells websites, then you're trying to sell a service. And so your approach to that is going to be building your website, creating the infrastructure for that website using a software package such as WordPress or obviously building your own custom, and then getting that product on there. Now you can use like OS Commerce. It's a free commerce solution. There's a number of e-commerce solutions available for WordPress. And I strongly suggest actually looking into a book related to e-commerce if you attempt to go that route for selling products and services online. It's not a very easy thing to do. Um, getting your product out there and having it show up amidst the slew of everybody else's product is hard work and really it can't be done anymore without a separate blog attached to your website generating some regular content that can hopefully drive some traffic. Or you will be paying for ad-based uh, services such as uh, AdWords, and those aren't bad services if the service you're offering has a higher amount of uh, revenue. So that's probably one of the good ways of actually generating, if you're selling a product or service, depending on the dollar amount of your product or service, you can always just buy ad space. But in the long run, you want to look up uh, SEO Made Simple is a great book for actually building your website based on SEO. I liked that one. And um, there's just a lot of keyword-centric things you're going to have to learn for that part of it. Uh, blogging you can just do anytime. If you wanted to be a professional blogger, you could use the service blogger. They'll let you post AdSense code right in their service. Of course, you have to qualify for an AdSense account and uh, that, that sort of thing. So if you're looking to make money online, there's a couple of avenues you can take. And I'd like to consult you individually or answer your questions here about that if you have, <laughs> if you have any specific questions about it. Um, it is a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of persistence. There's no real good way to make a lot of money online in a short period of time. There's just not. It's going to take some effort and some trial and error. I mean, a lot of people aren't willing to just jump into it and fail, and that's probably their biggest mistake with making money online. Before I started the PCM Tech Help Show, I failed at building a business online. I think I started a web design business, a web hosting business, a product sales business, a 
um, a graphics design business. A, I, I must have started at least six or seven different types of businesses and had them completely not work before I kind of fell into my little PCM tech help tutorials. And even when I did that, I didn't think I'd make any money on it. So it really it wasn't until after like two years of doing it for fun that I was like, wow, I can actually make money on this, monetizing my videos. So that's kind of what I mean is, is you kind of have to go into something you're passionate about and be willing to commit to it for a long period of time. And, and once you've kind of built up an audience and built up some traffic, that's really where your revenue options are going to become available. So if you don't choose something you're passionate about, then you're going to fall out of it before you even get into it. So those are my thoughts on making money online. There's a lot of different ways you can do it, and it really just heavily depends on what route you want to take. So we've hit our 10-minute mark. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about with making money online, but this show is this subscriber, this PCM Tech Help Live is for the subscribers to answer questions. So it looks like we got a couple of them lined up, and we'll go ahead and get started on these, and hopefully I can answer your guys' questions. Jack Barth says, hey. Hi, Jack. Then he asks if he's the only one here. Well, I'm here. Does that count? I'm the number one viewer of my show. Uh, Matt Jones says no. Good. He's not alone. He says, ha ha, okay. Uh, looks like a number of people are just saying hi, hello. S Dog, welcome back. Is it 3 a.m. for you, S Dog? Um, see, now this is what I love about my subscribers already. We're only on episode, what, seven? We're on episode seven here. And I've got these guys here. It looks like ADMRS3 is back, S Dog. You guys are truly committed to the show. I appreciate that. I appreciate having regular viewers come back, and it's just kind of cool to have people involved in the show in that way. Um, so that kind of gets me excited about the future of the show. Again, eight, seven episodes, I'll take, I'll take the small click of people who are awesome over the massive audiences any day. <laughs> really, that's, that's just, it is what it is. Um, C.J. Gagner, C.J. Gagner. Hi, Craig. What do you think of Microsoft charging $200 for Windows 8 starting February 1st? I didn't know they were going to do that, but I believe it. Um, let me confirm this. Uh, Windows 8, $200. Um, let me confirm this because, yeah, they're going to, looks like they are going to update it. Goes from $39 to $200. Uh, this was announced 17 hours ago from Isidia blog. And they're going to jump from $39 to $200. I don't think it's a good move because I think I think the $40 for a lot of people was a initial incentive for them to choose 8 over 7. And if this is actually going to happen starting February 1st, then one of the biggest selling points I was giving people on switching to 8 was that it was cheaper. Uh, I've, as you've probably known from watching my previous videos, not a huge fan of 8. I don't think the interface changes make give you a big enough advantage to jump into it from like Windows 7. Uh, but there's also that whole issue of money. So nobody wants to pay $200 to $250 for Windows 7 if they can go and buy Windows 8 for $60. Or if they buy the downloaded version, from what I understand, they can pay $40 right now. Uh, but the idea that now they're both going to be the same price, there's no real reason to switch to 8, I think other than if you have a touchscreen monitor, which, like I've said before, the touchscreen monitor interface does work well for Windows 8. And the more I work with Windows 8, the more comfortable I become with it. And even though I'm more comfortable with it, I still don't think the interface gives you the advantage that justifies purchasing the upgrade from 7. Because I still think that even if you master the Windows 8 interface, you still have to jump through a lot more hoops to accomplish the same tasks than if you're using Windows 7. That's just been my experience with it so far. Uh, it doesn't have good adoptability, which means that, uh, or usability, I guess is the word. In other words, it just, you can't adapt to it very well. Like if you want to just figure out how to do something, like shut that, shut it down, or find this piece, this program, or uninstall a piece of software, it's not really self-intuitive. So you can't really just figure it out most of the time. You have to look it up. Which is unfortunate, I think, because usability was one of the big things with Windows 7. That's why people keep their operating systems, Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows 7. Even though Vista was frustrating, 
it did have a good usability, you could at least figure out relatively easily what you were looking for, even though the interface was different. Uh, obviously, Windows 7 is a lot like Vista, only it runs a lot better, a lot better, a lot more stable, a lot more features. Uh, I'm a huge fan of 7. I think Windows 7 is the best operating system Microsoft has ever created, and I think that might have been a mistake because now they've created an outstanding operating system for desktops, and they're trying to create a new way to do it which I don't think is going to work out for them in the long run because what they had was so good as it was for a desktop environment. You know, if they wanted to create a tablet operating system, go ahead and do it, but don't force desktop users into a less efficient environment so that you can kind of market it in a way where they get used to it or are forced to get used to it so they'll buy your tablets. So, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that kind of frustrates me about it. But uh, I don't think it's a good move, dropping it up to 200 I think it's having trouble being adopted as it is. I think uh, the 40 to $60 was a good selling point for it, for people who are considering an upgrade from XP or Vista, and they're like, should I buy 7 or 8 And I would tell them, you know, how much money you got and how willing are you to adopt the new interface. You know, that's really kind of what it comes down to. So, good question. Excellent question. Thanks for letting me know that. I didn't realize it was going to jump up to $200. See, another great reason that I make this show about you guys, because you will ask me this question, and you're challenging me in new ways, and you're helping me learn all kinds of different ways to answer different questions on the fly. So, Oblivion Wolf 122 says, Hey, Craig, what do you think of Intel Socket 2011 CPUs? Um... I've always been a fan of Intel. Um, in, here's the thing about Intel. Uh, they are, as far as engineering is concerned, probably 8 to maybe even 20 years ahead of the sales curve. I did a, uh, there was a study we did in our informatics class where we talked about the technology cycle. The, the actual life cycle of technology is estimated to be two years. There's an actual law. I can't remember the name of the law, though. But it was a law that stated that every two years the, the technology either doubles or quadruples, okay? And the idea is that the market itself can't adopt it any faster than that. So a lot of these R&D companies like Intel and AMD and you name them, any of these companies, Apple I'm sure, are generations ahead of the market. So the market is actually far behind what technology's already, technology Intel and AMD have already engineered which makes sense. I mean, you look at the military stuff they're doing in contrast to the desktop consumer stuff they're doing, and you see that it's much more advanced, uh, but they don't actually let us adopt it. So that being said, by the time we get hit with a new piece of technology like the 2011 socket you're talking about, the technology's pretty much been perfected in a lot of ways. And so what I would say is I'd say Intel is still the way to go if you have the money, but it's still kind of like the question is do you get the bang for your buck? And there's a lot of benchmarking that goes into that. So it's hard for me to say, yes, all of the 2011 sockets from Intel are going to be superior to all of the AMDs because benchmarking a system doesn't just come based on the socket type and the processor type. I think the iCore series processors were outstanding, very exceptional, and still very cost effective. And I would almost steer people towards that still over buying a new one. Or I'm talking about the 1155, LGA 1155. Um, I built a, probably three or four PCs with that that particular core, and I was much happier than that than I was the uh, in the AMD alternative. But they were more expensive, quite a bit more expensive, almost double. So it really depends on what you want, because a lot of times the processor isn't what bottlenecks the system. If you have to drop your processor 80 bucks so you can invest the $80 in a graphics card because you're building a gaming system, I'd say that's probably a good move. Go with an AMD processor and buy a higher grade graphics card. So use that. Use your buying power to the best you, advantage you can, because quite often your processor isn't the bottleneck on your system anyway. So, I mean, that, I hope that kind of answers your question. I didn't really go into specific details, but it is kind of cool to, to realize that by the time you've, these processor technologies have hit the market, they've pretty much been perfected. That's why they're so stable, if you really think about it. Why is it that a new processor and a new processor socket comes out and there's very little problems that people have with processors? 
that's a huge part of it is because the technology is so ahead in their R&D that there's very few problems they have by the time they get hit your desk. Very cool stuff. Mr. Shadow Windows says, I'm here too. Welcome. Welcome, Mr. Shadow Windows. Jack Barth, how do you think Windows 8 will do on the market? Do you see a huge fail like I do? I don't want to say it's going to be a huge fail. Um, I think it's going to be significant because the market's not the same it used to be when they released when they released Vista. I think it might turn out to be worse than Vista. Because Vista, when it hit the market, there really wasn't a lot of PC alternatives at the time. So now people are kind of like deciding, a lot of them are kind of waving back and forth between should I get a tablet, should I get a PC, should I get a netbook, like, like the Google Chromebook. It, which is a, a netbook is basically a computer that's designed specifically for internet-based applications and, and programs. And so now we're in a situation where Microsoft thinks it can continue to bully themselves into markets. And they have kind of dropped the ball on, and I'm not a big Microsoft hater, I love Windows. But they've dropped the ball on the mobile. It took them a long time to get an actual smartphone that was tolerable in the market. And so they're really behind the ball on that. And then they dropped the ball on the tablets, and they kind of hit the market, what, four years late on that? And then when it finally hit the market, the price of it was so high that there were iPads cheaper than it. So now we're really kind of reaching a point where, okay, Windows 8 is a frustrating environment for a lot of people. And so now they have to choose. Uh, it's not like they go into a store and say, well, yeah, Windows 8's frustrating, but you have no other choice. That's true to a degree, but you do have another choice now in most cases. It depends on what you do with the computer. Now, if you need specific Windows operating system software, you probably don't have much of a choice unless that system, operating system softwares like Microsoft Word and Excel and Office, uh, any kind of productivity software suite, there are alternatives now for Apple and for uh, Linux and for like Ubuntu and for tablets that will actually read all of your old files and still let you edit them. Those alternatives weren't readily available and weren't reasonably priced at the time. So now they can go in there and look at a laptop and say, this laptop's $1,200, but it comes with Windows 8, and you're going to have to learn a whole new interface. And they're like, well, I really only use it for my email, my internet. Um, I use it for like reading all my buddies' files and watching the internet videos, which a lot of people pretty much live on the internet, Facebook. And so they're like, well, you know what? You, don't, you really don't need a, a laptop. You just need, you need, you want to be able to do Facebook, you want to be able to do your, your internet, you want to be able to do uh, Google, uh, and you can get by with a $500 or $400 tablet, and it'll be smaller, it'll be more efficient, it'll have a better battery life, and that's a great alternative for a lot of people. And so that also actually creates an issue with the Chromebook, because now Microsoft doesn't have the, you're familiar with it, selling point. You know what I mean? They can't go, well, yeah, we got the tablet, which is cheaper, but if you're used to using Windows, then you should probably go to Windows 7. You know? They can't really say it. They can't say that anymore. Well, if you're used to using Windows, go with Windows 8, because that's not a selling point anymore. Windows 8 is nothing like the other Windows environments. So they're going to have to learn a new user interface either way. So I think it actually kind of downgrades itself to a uneven playing field. I don't think it can compete on that level when it comes down to it, in a lot of ways. So, yeah, I see, I see a big fail. I do. Um, but I don't really see it in a way that will destroy Microsoft. Um, it really just kind of sees how I kind of, it depends on how they react to the failure of it. Uh, but right now, I would say it's already failing, as far as adoption is concerned. It's got a 3 out of 5 star rating on Newegg. Usability testing puts it at about 40 to 60% for actual comfort levels. And it's already pretty much failed out of the box. Uh, people are only getting it because they have to, not because they want to. I would define that as a software failure. So, next question. Matt Jones asks, Craig, what is the best free screen recording program? The best free screen recording program? Probably Cam Studio is the one I've had the best luck with. That was back when I had to use a free software recording program. Now, you can get that at my website. If you go to pcmtechhelp.com slash downloads, I do have like 80 free downloads that I've collected over my years in IT. And uh, screen capturing is one of them. 
Uh, if you go to the free download section, and it will be under, let me see right here real quick. Do, 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 do. It's under audio and video, I believe. Yeah, there we go. Audio and video. Then go to video, and you have Cam Studio. Cam Studio is an awesome piece of software that will allow you to actually record in full 1080p resolution, assuming your monitor actually supports that. If you check my website or my YouTube channel, Google Cam, uh, do a search on my channel or on my website for Camtasia. Um, I'm not. I'm sorry. Uh, on, for Cam Studio, and I do actually have a full tutorial on how to record in 1080 or uh, 720p with this particular recorder. It's not perfect, but I used it for about a year before I finally got Camtasia Studio, which cost me $300. But at that point, I had decided that I wanted to do this regularly, and the $300 didn't seem so intimidating. But that's my favorite one as far as free is concerned. Uh, I don't really know of a whole lot of alternatives. Maybe somebody else here has something to to share. Other than that, it looks like Jack Barth right above you had stated, I always liked Cam Studio for Windows, so obviously he's used it. Uh, it's really a great, great powerful piece of software for what it does. It seems like it's small and low budget. It actually looks nicer than it used to when I used it, but it does just about everything you want to do if you're doing screencasts. So, uh, Jack Barth said, Matt, I always like Cam Studio for Windows. I'm glad to hear I'm not recommending junk. S Nintendo, when deciding on a computer case, what do you look, what do you look for in shape, size, and design? It depends on the application. You're going to hear me answer these types of questions a lot. Uh, this is from S Nintendo. I hopefully I said that out loud. When you're deciding on a computer case, where is it going to sit? You need to consider your cooling. You need to consider the dust in the environment. If they're a smoker, if they're not a smoker, you should have filters or fans with filters on them. You need to consider the temperature and humidity in the location. Uh, a lot of times you want to determine your type of cooling based on that as well. If they're big time smokers and they don't have air conditioning and it's not going to remain at a constant temperature, Water cooling is the best route because you're talking about longevity in the equipment, right? Um, if it's an extremely dusty environment, you can install fans with uh, some cases come with embedded filters. So you can actually tie, uh, screw the filters onto it, and then you can change out the inside filter. Uh, cases, location of hardware is not such a big deal for me particularly. As long as there's adequate cooling, there should be at least one fan at the very top so that you can blow out the hot air because the heat rises. And uh, you can have one in the top back, but usually that's reserved for the power supply. Uh, but you should have something down towards the bottom of the case as well so you can suck in the cold air at the bottom. Does that make sense? You're sucking in cool air, you're blowing it up over the processor usually and out the top of the case in that particular case. Now, if you're actually in a dirty and nasty environment, you're not using fans, you want a totally enclosed case. You want, you want to be able to block the vents. You don't want anything to get into it and contaminate it. Uh, in the industrial world, they call that NEMA 4X or NEMA 4. And uh, what it is is it's like dust tight and you have to have like a liquid cooling system so it's totally enclosed in it. And that's like more for higher end sophisticated applications. But as far as where the USB ports go, I mean, I like them at the top of the case because most people put it under their desk. I mean, if it's going to sit on their desk, you want the USBs at the bottom of it. I mean, use some common sense. You know, it just depends on where you're going to put it and what you're going to use it for. Uh, I like Antec and Cooler Master cases. Uh, Cooler Master more so lately. I've been buying a lot of them. They're real cost effective. And the design, usually, I really like the look. But that's always personal preference. So I hope that answers your question. It's, it's kind of like a nutshelling of what you can do to decide on what to buy a case. Um, Cirque Batista asks, how do you broadcast live on YouTube? Now, I'm trying right now not to do screencasts because the quality of the YouTube broadcast is extremely low right now for live. And so I want to try to be able to explain it so people can listen to the show. Like I said, it is syndicated on iTunes. I want them to be able to listen and kind of figure out how to do it based on that. Now, when you go to your Google account, uh, rather than go straight to YouTube.com, you want to go to Google.com slash plus, okay? You have to create a Google Plus live account, I'm sorry, a Google Plus account in order to stream live to YouTube. And what they're doing is, is they're having you connect your Google Plus account to your YouTube channel when you start a Hangout. So when you actually click when you've actually logged in, created a YouTube, uh, Google Plus account, up in the right-hand corner, there's a button that says Start a Hangout. Click on that, and it'll pop up. 
And at that point, you get to create the name of your Hangout and invite people to it, whoever are in your circles, okay? There's a button right below the title that says Enable Hangouts On Air. And then at that point, it will ask you to connect your Google Plus account to a YouTube account. And you have to go through the steps to do that. And once you've actually connected with your YouTube account, you will be able to enable Hangouts On Air. And then when you actually start the Hangout, it will automatically publish it to YouTube. So anybody who subscribed to you on YouTube will see it in their feed. Okay, so it, Google's done a great job of kind of streamlining this entire process for broadcasters. I mean, the only thing that's semi-frustrating is we can only broadcast in 360p right now. But to be honest with you, it's really a really cool design uh, because the Hangouts are extremely flexible. Once I'm inside of a Hangout, you guys will see this on Wednesday, I can actually invite somebody in for an interview, and I have complete control over what you guys see. I can share my screen. I can share uh, somebody else's webcam if they're in the Hangout with me. I can mute their audio. I can enable their audio. I can show our chat. I mean, I can do all kinds of really cool things right within the Hangout window. So I can do a win, uh, an interview, like I'm going to this Wednesday. It would be Big Nate 84 I don't know if you guys have heard of him. Um, we're going to be talking about AV, audio, video, and we're also going to be talking about professional audio recording and things like that. If you're interested in broadcasting at all, I recommend coming and seeing that episode. Because what we're going to do is we're going to actually open the floor for Q&A after I do the interview, and hopefully he'll be able to help us out with that as well. So that's how you do it in a nutshell. Got to have a Google Plus account. Connect your Google Plus account to your uh, YouTube account. Oh, and this is very important. Make sure you use the same email address on your Google Plus account that you used on YouTube because there's no way to connect them if they don't have the same YouTube account. So the same email address. So next question. Excellent question, by the way. I like that one. I uh, get that a lot. Uh, John Ripath says, hi. Hello, John. Augustin Rada says, hi, hi. Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Matt Jones says, thanks, Jack. I have used Cam Studio in the past. Hopefully you liked it. If you didn't, it does take some getting used to. It's got some headaches associated with it. Uh, S Nintendog, 9, 12 p.m. Apparently you weren't the person that said that this 9 p.m. one was going to be at 3 o'clock in the morning. Somebody said that when I switched the time slot to 9 p.m., 9 p.m. Monday through Thursday, that I was going to actually be moving them to 3 a.m. So, my bad. So, Office Styles Media. Just found your channel today. Welcome to the madness, or welcome to the fun, as I said. Uh, I've got a number of ways people can find me. I am on all the major social networks. If you guys decide to connect to my social networks, I'm on Facebook personally, and I have a Facebook page. I announce it on both of those. Uh, Twitter, at Craig Chamberlain. Um, obviously on YouTube, that's PC Michiana, that's my old name, but that's how you find me. I prefer you go to my website, pcmtechhelp.com slash YouTube, that will bring you straight to my channel. That's pcmtechhelp.com forward slash YouTube, and then press enter, and that will forward you instantly to my YouTube channel. A great way to get a hold of my live stuff is to just do that, or all of my YouTube-based content if you're a big YouTuber. Um... Uh, but welcome to the channel. I've been doing this for a few years, and I just started the live streaming portion of it last week, and I think it's going out, going extremely well. It's cool to have people here. <laughs> I'm not sitting here talking to myself, which does help. Um, and it's also a really cool feeling to actually be, you know, have a podcast option. Actually, here, check this out. It's really cool to see this. Uh, and I'm, I'm really goofy about this. This kind of stuff. I have an app right on here. I don't know if you guys can see this. Let me go to podcasts. Uh, Apple makes you download a separate app for podcasts. Now look, I'm on it. You can subscribe to my app. You can, you can subscribe to my show right on that. That's that's way too fun. And look, I'm standing on my on mine. I'm right next to Leo Laporte. How cool is that? Leo Laporte's the man, by the way. If you haven't subscribed to him, you better because he is the I, the tech guy. That's his name. He's Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I like Leo. He's a good guy. Good teacher. Anyways, it's just kind of cool. I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of liking the show set up a lot better. So, Tom Walla says, Cam Studio is the best free screen recording app. Cool. We got two confirmations that it's a good one. Uh, I'm glad to hear it's still good because, like I said, I haven't used it in a while. But that was my favorite one. Who do you think would win the Royal Rumble, The Rock or CM Punk? The Rock. Totally. 
because he's hilarious in movies when he wants to be. Did you ever see um, Be Cool? If you haven't seen Be Cool and you're not sure if you like The Rock, you'll like him after seeing Be Cool. He's, he's hysterical in that movie. I think he's a better comedic act, actor than he is a professional actor, like in The Other Guys. He was good in that for what he was in it. But, uh, but yeah, just, just because. That's why I think he'd win. I like him better. Isn't that how wrestling works? It's whoever you like better. So, Raleigh Billy Jean says 9 p.m. is a good time for the cast. You know, I think so too. I uh, I did it the first time at 4 p.m. The first few times at 4 p.m. That just didn't work out for me. I got a wife and kid and all that stuff. And then I was like, what was I thinking? I can't get I can't guarantee that I'm going to get off work at the exact same time every day, especially since I work in a service industry. There's going to be many situations where they need me past that time frame, and how many of them am I going to end up canceling? Probably a ton. And so I worked out something with my wife so that she would make sure that the baby is in good condition while I'm gone between 9 and 10, and then they can, we can actually do this whole thing. And I'm actually kind of more relaxed than I was at 4 p.m. because it's kind of a wind-down time of the day. And I wanted it to be a non-formal type setup when I did the show. So I really agree. I think it's a much better time for the cast. It's a lot more fun. It's a lot more laid back. And I, I have a lot less pressure. So Matt Jones says, thank you, Tom Walla, for recommending Cam Studio. Mr. Shadow Windows says, hey, Craig, what do you think about Windows 8? I want to upgrade to it, but I play games on a weak graphics card. Will Windows 8 improve my gaming performance? This is from Mr. Shadow Windows, uh, all in one word. Um, unfortunately, probably no. Unfortunately not, because your hardware is designed to perform a certain way despite the operating system, and it really depends on the type of games you're trying to play and whether you're migrating from a 32-bit to a 64-bit operating system. I'm guessing you are running Windows 7 or Vista right now. Odds are it is a 64-bit. If you don't know how to check if your operating system is 64-bit, you uh, click on your Start Menu button. Let me verify this. And you type in MS Info, I believe. MS Info, is that it? No, that's not it. What is it? Uh, well, the easiest way is to actually click on your Start button right-click on computer and select properties and what it'll say is under system type if you're running Windows 7 it'll say 64-bit operating system uh, if you're running Windows XP you're probably 32-bit there's really no sense in checking because the 64-bit one was so incredibly unstable and they stopped supporting it and Windows Vista should show it in the same location as well so that should tell you uh, whether or not you're running it 64-bit. Uh, if you're running 64-bit already, you're probably getting the most bang out of your system as it is. And I would rather spend that money on upgrading my graphics card than on upgrading to Windows 8. Now, as somebody said earlier in the video, Windows 8 is going to be $200 after the 31st of this month. So if you are running a legacy operating system and you have to upgrade Windows at some point, you got to do two things. First, you've got to make sure that your Windows 8, your computer supports Windows 8. And I think they have an app for that. Windows, almost positive Microsoft has one. Windows 8 compatibility. Yes, uh, go to just Google Windows 8 compatibility, and Windows Compatibility Center will show up. And you're going to use this to verify that your uh, particular computer will support Windows 8, because you have to make sure that it will support it, because it has completely different drivers, completely different everything. If it does support it, then you have until the 31st of this month to get it for the $60, then it goes up to $200. If it goes up to $200, you might as well switch to Windows 7 because there's no real sense in going to 8 unless you have to, but um, it's not going to improve your gaming performance. If you want to improve your gaming performance, you got to buy a graphics card. And I can help you with that. I can't do it during this video, but if you send me an email, Craig at PCMTechHelp.com, you got to send me the model number of the system you're using and I can see if you have any options on it. Hopefully it's not a laptop because usually you have integrated graphics and you're out of luck. So I hope that answers your question and if it doesn't, post something here in the comments. John Repath says, hi, hello John, welcome to the show. What do you think of HP as a computer? Lomani57 asks. I think HP is pretty much on par with Dell, Gateway, Gateway, 
Um, pretty much all of them now are not great, but they're not terrible. Uh, they're not as bad as Acer, I would say, but they're not as good as IBM. They're kind of your mid-grade brand. Um, I would like to say that Dell is better than HP, but that was true once upon a time, but Dell has brought down their hardware prices so that they can compete in a Chinese market, and there's just no money in hardware anymore. So these guys are really, really trying to push cheap hardware for inflated prices, and then they package a whole bunch of bloatware with it so that they can actually make money on licensing after you've actually bought the computer. It's really unfortunate that this is where the laptop market has gone, but it's kind of like expected because computer hardware is always going to continue to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and that makes it more and more difficult for these big companies to compete and actually make a profit. There's not enough margin in it because they're competing with so many other companies that are trying to break into the market and a lot of companies trying to break into the market are selling them at cost just to get their name out there. And so as a result they're like, oh man, we need to somehow bring down the price of our hardware and we need to be able to compete with the pricing structure that they're giving. And we still need to make money. So that's kind of where HP, Dell, and Gateway, and all them actual companies come into play. Uh, so I still think they're a great mid-grade company, but you should still do research on the laptop before you buy it. I'm talking third-party research. Don't read the reviews that are at their website. Go to Amazon, go to Newegg, type in your model number or just Google it, type in the model number, and read, 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 read. You're making an $800 to $1,200 commitment. Don't just go out and buy it on emotion. You could regret it very, very much. So that's, that's what I would recommend if you're talking about HP. Like I said, they're not a terrible brand, but they're a mid-grade brand, which means you can go either way. They can make complete junk, and they can make great systems. So don't buy just on brand. Never a good idea. Jack Barth asks, what is your personal opinion of Windows 8 on the existing non-touch PCs? I, I've talked about this in great detail on my previous shows. I am going to touch on it uh, lightly here because you asked the question and you showed up, which makes you awesome. Um, and maybe somebody here hasn't heard it before. Uh, Windows 8 is a marketing gimmick from Microsoft. It's not, it's not a terrible operating system. In many ways, it's faster than Windows 7. It does support OctoCore, which is great. Uh, it it is a very efficient operating system as far as performance is concerned, obviously. But when it comes to usability, it's not just because I'm not used to it. A lot of people think that I complain about the user interface just because I'm not used to it yet. Well, there's a truth to that usually, traditionally, but the usability of Windows 8 is not intuitive enough for you to be able to really learn it on your own without outside help from like other websites or a help guide or some kind of a manual which isn't included uh, unless if you go to the PDF version if you can get to your Adobe Reader. Um, but I'm really kind of frustrated with Microsoft's attempt to force into a market a tablet based operating system onto desktop computers just so that when users go out and buy a tablet they're more inclined to buy the Microsoft tablet. I think it's going to have the opposite effect I don't think it's going to help them break into the tablet market, and I think it's really going to hurt their desktop market because it opens up opportunities for their competitors to compete with Windows. Like I said, the biggest selling point for Windows was always familiarity, user-friendly, will support my software, I can double-click on Word, and it'll open up Word. It's very easy to use. You know it. You've used it forever. And now that they've kind of taken that way as a selling point, people are going to consider the alternatives, and they already are. I've had more questions in the past three months about what should I do about this Windows 8 fiasco than I've ever gotten before on any previous Windows operating system. And I'm asking, I'm just trying to be honest with them. I'm asking, what are you using it for? You know, are you just using it for Internet? Are you just using it for, what, do you, what software do you use? And if that software isn't Microsoft exclusive, I'm usually steering them away unless they are really hardcore into using Microsoft software. I mean, they're steering them away or I'm moving them into a Windows 7 environment, which isn't cheap anymore because Windows 7 is 200 to 250 bucks. And it looks like they're now taking that advantage away from Windows 8 because Windows 8, one of the good things was, well, it's only $40, so now's the time to buy. So that's one advantage. But uh, no, I don't think it's a very good move for Windows. I don't, I, I, not at all. I think it'll come back to hurt them. 
and it's useless on a non-touch. The user interface is, to me, useless on a non-touch. It doesn't add any real value on a non-touch VC. It doesn't. So hopefully that won't piss anybody off. I'm not trying to hate on it, but I just don't think it does add the value. I think it is a great, Windows 8 is a great environment for a touch panel environment, but that's like no computers right now. And it shouldn't be forced on people who don't have them at all. So Lorenzo Casimir asks, are there any recommended number of core processors for a laptop to play games? Need for Speed or Grand Theft Auto? Need for Speed and Grand Theft Auto are older games. They probably only use a single core. So whether you buy a dual core or a quad core, it prints, the game itself will probably still only use one of the four cores. That being said, go dual or quad right now just because general operating system configurations support it and you will get much better performance out of your operating system as a whole. Uh, but uh, go quad if you can, i7, but they're a lot more expensive. Uh, but if you can't, go an i3. i3 is a great processor. Hey, that's a dual core. Uh, i5 is quad as well, so if you can find one cost effective. Uh, you can go the AMD equivalents as well if you want to save some more money. But uh, really, your gaming, your processor doesn't determine your gaming speed for the most part. It's, it's one element, but it depends heavily on your graphics card, very heavily on your graphics card, and how much memory you have, and the bandwidth on your memory. The speed of your memory, like whether it's DDR2800, DDR3, 1333, those factors are probably the biggest factors over the processor in your game speed. In most cases, that's what bottlenecks at first. And your hard drive now is a big element on boot times and things like that. So, Next comment is Reb1990X. Check out a program called SpeedFan. Thanks for contributing, Jack. I'm glad you're giving some people some recommendations. Um, but professions don't use computers. I think I skipped that question. That's not good. Reb1990X. Sorry about that. I skipped your question. Without using your computer, what professions don't use computers? What professions don't use computers? Well, it depends on your definition of a computer. Uh, construction. Um, wow, this is a toughie. I'm just so used to being around computer-based professions. I'm sure there's tons of butter churning. Is pro I don't know if that's actually a profession anymore. Probably not. If you're Amish, it is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, there's, there's. I don't know. There's probably not many anymore. I mean, we're so heavily dependent on computers now. Not necessarily a good thing. Uh, but uh, there's probably not many military aren't really dependent on any kind of military profession isn't really heavily dependent on it unless they're using they're in some kind of administrative position and they have to use it that's kind of a very difficult question to ask because I'd almost have to ask more questions like what do you mean by computer I mean because does if it has a microprocessor in it is it considered a computer or are you talking like a desktop computer because almost every industrial job, like maintenance and motor repair and electronics repair, none of those actually use computers. Uh, but they work on computers or work with them. It just depends on your definition. Hope that answers your question. I know it's kind of a fun question you were going to ask. You kind of you kind of stumped me there a little bit, but uh, I would have to elaborate. Tom Wallace says. Lomani 57, stay away from HP, Gateway, and Compact Machines. Now he's suggesting, probably this, based on the same information I'm saying, I wouldn't say stay away entirely, uh, but do your research before going out and buying one because they are cost effective, and you can get a great Dell system or HP system. They do make them. They're not extremely common anymore, but they do make them. So I don't want to write them off entirely. Dell, I loved Dell for the longest time. I don't like them so much now. Their latitudes and business ones aren't as stable as they used to be, but uh, but a lot of people will try to steer you away from them. But I'd always recommend researching what you want first. You got, you got a smartphone, man, probably. Okay, so when you're at Best Buy or wherever you're at looking at it, just type the model number right into your search. Download an app called, I, I use it all the time. Um, it's called Shopping, I think. Let me see here. Shopping, shopping, shopping. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, it's like a shop and scan app. I thought I still had it on here. Maybe I removed it. Removed it. I did. I just used it a bunch of times for Christmas. For Christmas, Quick Scan. That's what it's called. Quick Scan. Here's Quick Scan. Okay, you pull up Quick Scan, and um, you can just scan barcodes. 
Okay, and if you don't have the barcode, you can just type in the item's part number, the model number. They'll put it right on the tag on whatever you're looking at, and it'll bring up a whole bunch of different websites with reviews and all kinds of stuff on it. Online prices, so you don't get ripped off. Great tool to have. Make sure you have it. Have something on your smartphone to research pricing and products before you buy them at a store. Know what you're buying. You've got the most powerful tool in the world, basically, when it comes to purchasing power and making sure that you're making smart purchasing decisions. Don't waste it. Smartphone is going to save you a lot of money if you let it. Okay. Um, Reb1990X asks, why do people pay for operating system? Well, a lot of people pay for them because they it's not worth the time and effort for them to learn a new one that won't cost them money. If you have been using Windows your entire life and or for a couple of years and you finally have gotten the hang of it and you've gotten efficient and productive with it, a lot of people, it's not worth the hundred bucks that it's going to take them three weeks, four weeks to learn a whole new operating system. Some people value their their time a lot higher than others. So like for me, for example, I've got a I've got a wife and kid, I work a full time job, and I do this on part time. When I'm all of a sudden greeted with the decision that I can pay thirty dollars now but have to spend eight hours to learn something, or a hundred dollars now and already know how to use it, the hundred dollars now is a lot more tempting. Simply based on the fact that I don't have a lot of spare time. And so that's one of the main reasons people buy a new operating system. A lot of reasons why they buy them too is they've upgraded an existing software package and it doesn't support their old operating system. It only supports the new one. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of factors, a lot of reasonable factors why people would buy an operating system. Yes, Linux, Ubuntu, uh, KDEs, all the distributions of Linux will have open source alternatives, but there's a learning curve associated with it. There's installation factors, there's hardware factors. And there's a lot of things that come into play for the average user that they just don't want to mess with. So they'd rather upgrade. So you could probably hear my baby crying in the background. Sorry about that. Uh, hopefully my wife will get to her soon. <laughs> okay, uh, Rem1990X. Off topic, just out of curiosity, um, what is your favorite all-time superhero and supervillain? Oh, my. Superhero and supervillain. Oh, dude, this is not a fair question. Uh, I'm a huge movie fanatic, too. So superheroes right now, I mean, I used to hate Thor, but the movie was fantastic. Uh, I used to hate Captain America, but the movie was fantastic. Actually, I, I always liked Iron Man, but he's probably my favorite right now out of all the new superheroes in the movie. But after Avengers, I loved them all. Um, but my favorite probably depends on the mood I'm in. Uh, I love the new Batmans. But they're darker. You know, he's more of a human dark character. So I can't really jump on say I always love Batman more than Iron Man because they're like two different worlds, man. That's like an unfair question. And it's not just because one Marvel's and one one's DC. That's not why. It's because it's just an unfair question. I don't want to have to pick. I don't want to have to pick. <laughs> always loved Wolverine, but they kind of botched the new movies there. Um, super villain. Don't even get me started. Super villain. Probably the new Joker on the new Batman was my all-time favorite supervillain in a movie. And I don't say that often. That's usually a very touchy topic for me. But from Batman 2, he nailed it, man. Heath Ledger, the, the person I least, least expected to nail a Joker role, nailed it. Love Christopher Nolan. Love everything he does. So I won't spend too much time on that, but hopefully that kind of uh, gives you some headway. Um... Oh, man, I'm running out of time here, and it looks like i got a ton more comments. This is awesome. I'm so glad you guys came. I am going to spend the last five minutes breezing through these, and if you want me to elaborate on them, tune in tomorrow, Monday through Thursday, 9 p.m. Uh, just tune in tomorrow. I have to do these first in, first, first out. It's only fair. And so now I'm going to zing through the rest of these questions. I'm going to give you short, pithy answers. If you want me to elaborate on them further, you can send me an email, craig at pcmtechhelp.com. I'll try to elaborate on them. But if you show up tomorrow night and you're here at the beginning of the show and you ask them, then you will get answered in much more detail. So let's say Jack Barth says, Tom, why don't you like HP? I understand Gateway since they're close to bankruptcy. Uh, that's a question towards another user, so we'll skip that one. SSI.com says, 
hey, SSSI.com says, hey, Craig, great show, by the way. Any tips on how to set, get scan with Windows Defender in the right-click context menu in Windows 8? Add items, context menu, Windows 8. You probably have to hack it through the registry. Um, Windows 8 secrets, the WinX menu and its hashtag algorithm. Last week, reader Windows fan tipped me off an article indicating how to customize the new WinX menu in Windows 8. You know the menu that appears when you right-click in the lower left start tip. Eh, that's kind of a way to do it, but that's not your actual context menu. Uh, so that's kind of a cool article. That one's titled Win 8, Windows 8 Secrets in the WinX Menu and its Hashtag Algorithm. So you can Google that. Opening context menu just above the item. How to send to context, add to send to context menu. Yeah, see, that doesn't really count either. Well, now, why would you want to do that, just out of curiosity? Um, that would be one of the big questions I would ask, because if you just press the Start Menu button and you type in Windows, like if you bring up the Metro by pressing the Start Menu button, start typing the word that you're looking for, it'll show up in the left-hand side. You might have to click Apps on the right, but if you just press the Start Menu button, type in Windows, and space Defender, or just type Defender, it's going to show up on the left-hand side. So that would be my actual, the quickest way to do it, that's easier than right-clicking and clicking on something, I think. But uh, hopefully that kind of answers your question. Sorry, I kind of have to graze over it. I might have to look into it. Rev1990X, do you like YouTube's new eye? Yes, I do, um, because they're migrating to Google+. Plus. They're going to meld the two together. Talked about this before. Uh, they're trying to make YouTube and Google Plus look very similar in the slow migration process. Eventually they want to make them one thing which will work out great for YouTubers like myself and broadcasters like myself because I want to be able to connect with you guys as subscribers on Google Plus. Do you see what I mean? I think it will be a great way to create a community and uh, an environment where everything's heavily balanced just within one social network. So yes, I'm a huge fan of this migration. A lot of white space. That's a little annoying, but they'll figure out something to fill it with. Tom Walla responds to Jack Barth's question. Uh, Jack Barth asks, where do you work, Craig? I work for Precision Electric. It's an industrial automation company. Well, industrial services company out of northern Indiana. Um, ADMRS3 says 9 equals 8 p.m. here, so this time frame works out great for me. I'm glad the time frame works out great for you because it works out great for me as well. Tom Walla responds to, <laughs> to uh, Jack's question. ADRMRS3 says, love my HP laptop, DV4 AMD Turian, great processor, Turian 2, dual core, 2.5 gigahertz, 4 gigabyte memory, Win 7, 64-bit, love Windows 7. 500 gigabyte hard drive bought four years ago, and only problems I've ever had was error, if you know what I mean, viruses. Yeah, normal stuff. Normal stuff you'd expect from a flexible operating system like Windows. And I love Windows, so... Jack Barth says, Craig, I have a Windows 7 laptop, Nexus 7, and an Android smartphone. For my next laptop purchase, what do you recommend if I can't afford a Mac and Linux is too much for me? Hmm, that's a great question. I really wish I didn't only have two minutes to answer it. Uh, I have used multiple Linux OSs before. Okay, you have Windows 7, Nexus 7, and an Android smartphone. For my next laptop purchase, what do you recommend and if, if I can't afford a Mac and Linux is too much for me? Well, don't go Mac or Linux, which leaves you with Windows. Uh, laptops, depends on what you want to do with it. I've had a lot of fun with cyber power PCs because I'm a big gamer. Uh, they also have great standard laptops. They build them custom. Out of, they're out of California. Great company. Um, and you can basically customize your entire build. Very cost effective as well. Uh, I got this hardcore gamer laptop for like $1,600, which is a lot of money for me. You can buy mid-grade to low-grade systems from them around the seven eight hundred dollar range. I had a friend of mine buy one of those. He was very very happy with it. He's loved it since he bought it. Very high quality hardware that they use. Um, they benchmark them all prior to shipping them, so you know kind of know what you're going to get at least from a frame point, frames per second point of view. And that's CyberPowerPC.com. Uh, the other company I recommend right now is Sage. I think it's Sager. Sager. Sager Notebook. Sager Notebook, also uh, extremely cost-effective systems, custom-built, built-to-order, fantastic company. They've been around for a very long time. Another kind of like no-name third-party company, but I'm a big fan of these companies because you get more of a personal touch to your, pro to your product because they, they have to. In order to compete with the big names, 
they have to offer you something that the other guys don't offer, and in most cases, that's quality of service and quality of hardware. And since they don't have as big of a marketing budget, they can afford to offer you a better product at a lower price. So I'd probably go with a Sager. You could go with a, your standard Asus laptop. I go to uh, Newegg.com and uh, just do some research there. Uh, the, the Asus makes great laptops, but then you can buy on review. If you go to Newegg.com, you can do a product search and then sort by, uh, on the left-hand side, choose like your screen size, choose the type of mouse you like, choose what kind of uh, hardware you want it on the left. You can even choose manufacturer if you're comfortable with that. I never recommend buying on brand, but then on the right-hand side, you can sort it by rating. And so then you can kind of use that tool to sort through all of your available options. And a lot of times, companies like CyberPower and Sager actually do sell through Newegg. And so that's a great place to do some research on it. Uh, I do all my research on Newegg.com, so check them out. But I'd probably recommend if you're not a big gamer, just just do some basic research. CyberPower and uh, and Sager are good companies, and just check out the New Egg research, and you'll have plenty of options to choose from. Don't go to a store and buy one. Not enough options for me. Unless and if you do go to a store, like I said, use your smartphone. Look it up. Look up the model number before you buy. You're making a huge investment into the into the computer. And when you're talking about Windows 7, if you like Windows 7. A lot of, like, Sager and CyberPower will build you a system with Windows 7 still. So that's something very important to make note of. And very important. Most of the big name HPs, Dells, they will not build you a system anymore with Windows 7 on it. So if you go to those companies, I hope they're still doing it. As of five months ago, they were. No, as of a month ago, they were. Still building them with Windows 7. you got to wait a little longer, but it's worth it. Matt Jones says, why are Macintosh computers and Apple devices in general so expensive? Ooh, loaded question. There's a lot of legitimate reasons they are more expensive. And in a nutshell, it's because it's a closed platform. Apple has basic control over the entire hardware scheme. They use very expensive hardware when they're actually manufacturing the products. And they're heavy, 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 heavy on app development and security which means that they appeal to more of a niche audience that's looking for an extremely powerful software package that does one to two to three tasks extremely well. That's why you see photographers using them, you see video editors using them, you see uh, a lot of businesses now starting to adopt them, and it has everything to do with the headaches associated with a flexible operating system like Windows and paying extra for let more security and more app stability. And that's kind of the nutshelling answer. There's I got a lot more to say about that, but I can't really fit it into the rest of today's show. So um ADMRS there says, sure she's no gamer PC, but I'm not a gamer. It does everything I need it to. SME times video buffering annoying. And if you're just a web guy, check out the tablet. Check out the Chromebook. $250. Wow. I can't believe what you get. Um Low Manny says, I need one for game programming. I'm in school for video game programming, and that's what I need it for. Game programming, I would probably go with, I'd probably go with CyberPower. Anything game-based. Plus, you'll look cooler. I'm not going to lie. They are cool-looking laptops. <laughs> Jack, Tom Waller responds to Jack, Jack's question again. Jack responds to Tom again. I'm glad I can elaborate on this to all my viewers. Uh, Gino, I don't mind you guys doing that, by the way. It doesn't bother me. G-I-N-O-O-N, Ginong Bubyoyog. I can't pronounce that. I'm terrible with this. G-I-N-O-O-N-G-B-U-B-U-Y-O-G. That's a mouthful. AMD FX3850 or Intel i5-3570K. Planning to buy a new PC with Grand Theft Auto 4 and Skyrim, etc. What should I pick, Craig? AMD versus Intel. You have very specific requests. You have to do a Google search and compare the actual benchmarks against these two processors. Then you've got to weigh the pros and cons of how much they're going to cost as opposed to whether it's worth the added benchmark benefit. Odds are your Intel i5 is going to spec better than the AMD FX 8350, just guessing, but you're going to get more bang for your buck out of the AMD FX 8350. So then you have to decide, do you spend less money on a processor that's inferior and invest that money into a different part of your computer? 
a lot of times I recommend, hey, yeah, your processor will be, sm uh, will be slower, but you will have 80 to 100 extra dollars to invest in your graphics card, much, much more of an investment into your machine than the little bit extra processing power you're going to get. Just some things to consider, but that's where I'd start. Grand Theft Auto V, make sure you have a good graphics card. That's all I'm going to say. CJ Gagner says, have a good night, Craig. Hey, CJ, you have a great night, too. Now, I'm going to reload this page one time, and it looks like we are going to be done. Everyone's saying, having a great show. Thanks for the great show. Jack Lomani, 57, and Matt Jones say, great show tonight. Hey, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys coming out. I really enjoy doing this. Very fun for me to do. Hopefully I helped some of you guys. I've answered some of your questions. Hopefully people listening got something out of it. And I'm going to be here at the same time tomorrow, 9 p.m. Now remember, visit my website, pcmtechhelp.com. All of my videos go live there. I also do my own personal blog posts there. I do have a couple writers who contribute articles. Uh, if you want to check out my YouTube channel, just go to pcmtechhelp.com slash YouTube. Remember, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, my no, not MySpace, whoa, Facebook, Twitter. I have a, I have a Facebook page, by the way. Uh, Google Plus has a page. If you go to my website, it's on the right-hand sidebar, you'll see all those. Not Facebook so much anymore. No, no, it'll be there. They'll all be there. And you can connect with me on there. I'm on LinkedIn as well, if you're on the professional network. And uh, I really, really am having a lot of fun with this. So uh, let's see what else we got here real quick. Love the show. I'll be back tomorrow. All right. Windows 8, I have a problem long time. Sorry, Gamer Stasia. Remember, come in tomorrow. If I didn't elaborate on your question enough, show up at 9 p.m. tomorrow. If your question is one of the first ones in the pipeline, I will give you the attention that you deserve. So that's what I like to do. So thanks for visiting the PCM Tech Help Show. Again, I am your host, Craig Chamberlain. I'm on all the major social networks. We broadcast live Monday through Thursday, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern. You can actually follow the show right on iTunes. Just look up the podcast right in your search on the iTunes store. That's PCM Tech Help. That's it. That's all you got to search for. I was going to say .com, but that's it. PCM Tech Help. And I'll show up right at the top. You'll see my big cheesing face right at the top of it. And uh, hopefully things will continue to grow. This was probably my best show I've had so far. So thank you all for coming by. I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>